Revenge, a desire for vengeance or retribution. Revenge is a response to a transgression, a need to harm someone who has harmed you. In 1998, Swaziland's David Tabo Simelane wanted revenge. Unfortunately, his vengeful mission led to the death of approximately 40 women and children. Hi, my name is Faith Njoroge. Welcome to True Crime Tuesday, a series on my channel where I talk about true crime cases in Africa. I upload new videos every other Tuesday, and if you like true crime like me, please subscribe to my channel and turn on the notifications. If you'd like to find out more about this case, I put links on all of my sources in the description box below. Also, a bit of a disclaimer, um, I'm probably going to butcher some of these names. <laughs> um, I might pronounce them wrongly. If I do, especially the victims' names, I apologize, but I will try my best to pronounce them the way that they're supposed to. David Tabo Simelane was born in 1956 in Eswatini, a landlocked country in Southern Africa, formerly known as Swaziland. His birth name was David Tabo Mhalanga, but he was raised from infancy on his aunt's Simelane homestead. It was located in a remote part of the country. In exchange for herding the family cattle and helping with the harvest, the Simelanes paid his school fees. According to his aunt, he stopped going to school after finishing the 10th grade. His uncle tried to get him to attend secondary school, but he had decided to drop out. He will spend nights in the forest, eat from other people's fields, and come back to the homestead and sleep in the kraal, a domestic animal pen. Speaking about his childhood, his aunt stated that, quote, even when he was in school, he was someone who was leading a nomadic life. She also called him a very brilliant child who started school later than some of his peers and soon surpassed them. When David was 19 years old, he was arrested for stabbing his girlfriend. She survived and he served 15 months in prison. In the late 70s and early 80s, police records show that he was convicted of indecent assault, robbery and burglary. He once went to jail for threatening to stab a woman with a knife in order to steal a handbag containing the equivalent of $2. In a later interview, one of his ex-girlfriends said, quote, He seemed like a very kind man, but when I looked deeply, I noticed that he had a subtle violence in him that he was trying to suppress. In the early 90s, he was arrested for rape and robbery. David confessed to robbing the victim, but claimed that he did not rape her. Unfortunately for him, the court found him guilty for both the robbery and the sexual assault. He was sentenced to six years in prison. After this incident, something changed in David. He felt that he was sent to prison on a false accusation. He developed a deep hatred for women. After his release in 1998, he decided to take revenge. He did so by committing a series of sexual assaults and murders. The murders took place between the late 1990s to 2001. In March of 2001, 26-year-old Samantha Gassi Ngobese disappeared. She had a law degree from the University of Swaziland and was hoping to use it. She decided to travel to Mbabane, the capital city of Eswatini, to apply for a job at the High Court. Her plan suddenly changed when she was at the bus stop in Manzini. She had met a man who introduced himself as Tabiso Sikodze. They started a conversation and he told her that he could get her a position at a chemical company. The job would pay her well, 4,000 emalangeni, which is about $240. Excited about this new opportunity, Samantha abandoned her plans for traveling to the capital city. She ran back home to change and inform her family about her new job and the man that had offered it to her. She left her home and her family never saw her again. At around the same time, Fikile, a 37-year-old preschool teacher and her one-year-old daughter, Lindokule, were missing. 
Fikile's husband, Simon Moza, had last seen his wife and daughter on the night of March 10th, when he and Fikile had an argument. The couple did not live together during the work week, and she had left Simon late at night to head back to the home of her in-laws. A few days later, Simon found out that his wife and daughter never arrived, and Fikile did not show up to her job. He called her family, but they had also not seen her. Simon reported them missing and started frantically looking for them. He called all the major hospitals, but he could not find them. Desperate, he called diviners, people who could help him through supernatural means, but they could not see her in their mirrors. This led Simon to think that his wife was dead. On April 2, 2001, in Eagle's Nest Farm in Malkans, a market town 15 miles from the city of Mankayane, a worker stumbled upon the decomposing bodies of two women and a baby girl. The bodies had been in the bush for about three weeks and one of the child's legs was missing. Simon Mozart was able to identify two of these bodies as his wife and child. Fikile's hands had been tied behind her back and she had deep cut wounds on her head and neck. He identified his daughter by her clothes. Unfortunately, the third body was not positively identified. A few days later, a human skull was found in a plastic KFC bag in the same area. On April 10th, six skeletons and a decomposing body were also found all within a short distance from each other. This brought the death toll to 11. The police were alarmed and began warning people to be vigilant and urged them to stay in their homes at night. The first bodies were all found in and near Usutu Forest in Malkans, a huge man-made forest spreading over more than 160,000 acres. Two of the nation's top officers were assigned to head the investigation. They asked the public for help and published their cell phone numbers in the newspapers. They also brought in more than 200 police officers and soldiers to search the Eagle's Nest area. An additional 13 sets of remains in different stages of decomposition were discovered. The death toll had risen to 24. With news of the murders spreading all over the country, the police were flooded with reports of missing women. Some had been missing for as long as 16 months. Some of the victims included Cindy Ntiwane, Vosho Ndlamini, Ntombi Nzimanze, Dumefi Manana, Sizeni Ndlangamandla, and Nompumelelo Mamba. The deputy police commissioner at the time said, quote, Never in the history of the country have you experienced such a spate of killings. A reward of 50,000 emalangeni, which is around $3,000, was offered in exchange for any information leading to the arrest and prosecution of the perpetrator. Based on the last sightings of the missing women and the locations of the bodies, police traced the final steps of the victims. Most of them were last seen in or known to have been traveling to Malkans or Manzini. These are towns where job seekers might be headed to in Eswatini. The police attempted to track down those who had last been seen with the victims. Different names were floating about, but one thing was clear. The killer or killers were taking advantage of women looking for jobs and desperate for money. Several victims had last been seen with a man who had promised them work at a garage, a parking plant, or even at a police station. Because of the large numbers of victims, some police officers thought that they were looking for more than one murderer. The Swazi police sought help from South African police who brought in specialists in forensics, investigative psychology, and profiling. In addition, the South African police assisted in identifying the bodies using DNA profiling and facial reconstruction. This level of expertise was not available in Eswatini at the time. With the death toll rising to about 28 women and children, the public's reaction to the murders was immensely sympathetic. Religious people were praying and women were marching saying the killer must be found. 
As part of a prayer service at the National Soccer Stadium during the Easter festival, the king's mother and co-ruler of Eswatini asked the nation to work with the police to find the people responsible for the murders. She, quote, called upon Christians to pray for the country as it was apparent that the demons of the devil had taken its toll. Also offering help was the Zionist Christian prophet Simanga Mtalane, who vowed to assemble a team to use divine powers to aid in the investigation. Simanga said that he and his team of prophets would find those responsible and bring them to the authorities. He said, quote, this is a war. Everyone should come together and work towards getting the killers. On the 25th of April, 2001, the husband of a missing woman recognized a suspect at a supermarket in Langano. The police were called and an arrest was made. The man they arrested was 43-year-old David Tabo Simelane. David was brought to the station by local police, who then called in the investigative team. According to investigators, David confessed to the crimes without coercion. In his confessions, David admitted to murdering 32 women and three babies. He stated that he made women go into the forest with him, tied them up, sexually assaulted them, then strangled or stabbed them with his bare hands if they resisted too strongly. He also beheaded many of them, either before or after death. He would often steal money and valuables from victims in order to gamble. When asked to explain his motive for the murders, he stated that it was revenge against women due to the alleged false rape charge from 1991 for which he served time. He again claimed that he robbed the victim but did not rape her. In his second written confession from May 2001, he stated, quote, I then told myself that I will revenge to any woman if the chance avails itself. When word of David's arrest reached the public, there was speculation that he was going to be very good looking. How else could he have led so many women to dark places to kill them? They thought that he had to be charming, rich, educated, and good with the ladies. However, when the public finally got a glimpse of him, they were disappointed. One Swazi writer described him as having, quote, a broad forehead, average-sized bloodshot eyes, an apology for a nose, <laughs> and a mouth that must have been carved with a pencil knife. David was anything but handsome. <laughs> wow, savage. In June, the police took David out of his holding cell so he could lead them to more bodies. Much of the search was videotaped, including when he was read his rights and told that what he showed them could be used against him in court. Some of the locations that he had dumped the bodies were so remote that authorities had asked for the aid of helicopters. The police found a total of 45 bodies. The bodies of four babies were also among the dead. Once all the bodies were recovered, the next step was figuring out exactly who he had killed. Since most of the found bodies had decomposed, the police quickly turned to using the victim's clothing as proof of identity. They held an identification parade, bringing in friends and family of David's victims to match pieces of clothing to those that belonged to their loved ones. Some of the clothing had been found near the bodies and some had been found in the possession of one of David's girlfriends. The entire thing was videotaped. The footage taken confirmed that David was in the room and cuffed and helping the police and victims' families attribute pieces of clothing to each woman and child. In the video, it was clear that the clothing was not gently handled. The police can be seen riffling through items in plastic bags and old suitcases, and some just tied up with a white string. The relatives identified bras, dresses, blouses, baby clothes, shoes, and more. At one point in the video, David takes the shirt off his back, telling the investigators that it belonged to the victim whose family is sitting in front of him. <laughs> The woman's son has kids and has 
as a school room in my place. In a bizarre twist, David is seen describing to the victims' families how he met and killed their loved ones. Wow, audacity. Two written confessions were submitted as evidence during the trial. One from the day after he was arrested and the other taken 12 days later in front of a different magistrate. The confessions were written by a translator in English. The written confession included an inadequately numbered list of victims. Several of the women he confessed to killing were either unnamed or identified only by a surname. David was eventually held on 35 counts of murder, but four years into his trial, the number of counts was reduced to 34, when it was discovered that two of the victims named were the same person. The prosecution had to make sure that David was fit to stand trial. From the time of his arrest to the beginning of his trial, several incidents indicated that he might not have been psychologically or physically sound. Over the years, it was reported that he went on a hunger strike, overdosed on some unspecified substance, had a stroke, beat his head against a wall, and tried to hang himself with a shirt. In October 2004, he was taken to Mbabane Government Hospital, where he was unconscious for five days in the ICU. Both in 2001 and 2004, he was reported to be very sick with an undisclosed illness. This led many to believe that he was HIV positive. Just before his head-banging incident, a psychiatrist assessed him and concluded the following. He is an adult male who claims he has no physical or mental problems. He is fully conscious and fully alert. He presents with a restricted affect. He also claims to feel sad most of the time, but with no suicidal ideation. He also admits to auditory hallucinations in the past, but they have since stopped. His thought form is normal and no delusions have been noted during interview. Also, he shows no signs of being disordered. He is coherent and gives a good account of himself. He is fit to stand trial in court. David's trial finally began in 2006, more than five years after his arrest. The delay was attributed to the police's failed attempt to collect DNA evidence. The Department of Anatomy at the University of Pretoria in South Africa was helping the Swazi police in identification. They were only able to prove the gender, age range, and race of some of the skeletal remains found. However, after years of waiting, not a single body could be positively identified by experts post-mortem, nor could the cause of death be confirmed. South African police did not receive the help they needed from the Swazis. The Swazi police never said why they couldn't get conclusive DNA evidence. At the trial, 83 witnesses testified against David. He was represented by attorney Lucky Howe, who was at some stage fired as Prodeo counsel after accusations that he was delaying the case. However, David engaged Howe as a private attorney, but was eventually forced to drop him because of the alleged delays. Criminal attorney Mduduzi Mabila took over the case. David turned around and denied confessing to his crimes. Through his lawyer, David complained during trial that his confession was not voluntarily recorded because he was threatened with death. David himself also stated in the witness box that he had not confessed voluntarily. He told the court that the late superintendent Jomo Mavuso had warned him that if he did not comply with the police, he was going to die in their custody. He also stated that he was also suffocated by the police. On the 23rd of March 2011, David Tabo Simelane was found guilty of 28 counts of murder. In a 232-paged verdict, High Court Judge Jacobus Annandale 
stated that the identification of personal property which used to belong to missing relatives that were recovered either in the immediate areas where the human remains were found or from a place where David had taken the police to justifies the only reasonable conclusion that can be drawn that the deceased persons are those lost relatives who used to own the personal belongings. The judge also stated that it was clear that David killed the women out of revenge after he was allegedly incarcerated for a sexual assault he never committed. He stated that during his last conviction, David decided what he wanted to do and went ahead and killed a large number of Swazi women and children. He said, quote, Ever since the trial began, the court had never had a single word of apology. There is not even a single half-hearted attempt to show remorse. Even the friends and families of the victims never got an apology from David. Judge Annandale stated that after careful consideration of all that had been put before court, it all boiled down to two options, a conviction of 700 years in jail or the death penalty. He revealed that the sentencing stage was the most difficult. He said that owing to the atrocities that had been done to women and children, he could not be allowed to live with society. David was to be sentenced to death through hanging. After sentencing, members of the public present at the court started celebrating. However, this did not go down well with Judge Annandale. He said that a person was going to be killed and that he did not know why they were celebrating. In 2011, David appealed to the Supreme Court. It was ruled that the trial had taken an unacceptably long time, but the death penalty was upheld. No executions have been carried out in Eswatini since 1983. So, David remains in custody to this day. According to his aunt, David found faith in prison. He considers himself a born-again Christian and preaches to his fellow inmates. Okay, and that is the end of this video. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching until the end. Uh, what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think that David was out for revenge? Or was he just using that as an excuse to commit murders? Let me know in the comment section below. Again, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Also, you could leave suggestions on which African cases you think I should talk about next. If you would like to read more on this case, I put links on all of my sources in the description box below. Feel free to check them out. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Bye.